outro cast. Right on time there. How's your day going so far, Reese? Good. How are you? Great. Are you dialing in from Los Angeles? Yes, I am. Dumbbody's got to. Well, appreciate you taking the time. Longtime fan of what you do. You have a new special. Is this your fifth special? It is. Yes. Hard to believe, but I've been around for a long time. <laughs> for sure. How much prep was needed for this special compared to the last one? Because I'd imagine the old cliche of, you know, your first special, you've been writing it your whole life. Then the next one you have like a year and then you kind of do it a little differently. The third and the fourth, in your case, the fifth, was it easier? Yeah, you, you sort of get into a system. And for me, I found after about the second special that it was wait two years between specials. So you've got enough material um, and then create it uh, slowly over time. You know, there's nothing worse than having a slapdash effort of putting all your material together uh, into something that doesn't have a narrative and really, you know, doesn't make sense at the end of the day. I think each show should have a message, should have a, a through line, um, and then you sprinkle your, your stand-up through it. And, you know, the audience, you find that over time, they love to walk away with a point being made or a story being told. Sure. And in this case, you know, uh, it's about my mother's passing, and so that happened. And so then, um, you know, I did have quite a bit of time afterwards to sort of contemplate it all and take it in and experience the grief. And so in that time, you know, I put this show together and it took a long time to come out this one, but um, here it is. Here it is. Did you know all along, or I should ask, what point in the process did you know that comedy dynamics would be presenting the special? Uh, not till I'd done it all. Uh, yeah. So we had a meeting with them. I had this special. I wanted to put it out there cause it's, it's really special, uh, to me. And, uh, so yeah, the stars aligned and they decided, uh, to work with me. And so it just made sense on this particular one down the line, fifth special to get it out when the world's so different now, back in the day, of course, I used to put out DVDs, you know, that just right. doesn't happen anymore. Um, and with social media and, everything that's possible through the internet and the, and the, and the extended reach I can have through something like comedy dynamics. It just made sense with my international audience to, to use them. I've had the pleasure of interviewing Brian who owns or runs whatever you want to call it, comedy dynamics. And the message that always comes through is he's going, these are comedians. They're doing their art. I'm going to let them do their art per se. So it sounds like you made it before you agreed to work with them per se. So you didn't get a lot of notes. This is you in the special. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, I'm uh, I'm 47. I'm kind of beyond notes now. Uh, so it's kind of like I've been doing this a long time, 20, yeah. 25 years. I know what I want to do. I know how to self-edit. Uh, but even at that point, as an artist, you still get told by the people around you, your closest um assets are, are your friends and they can tell you hey you need to cut that bit down or that bit's not working for whatever reason so as a comic you definitely have a small group of people that you mm -hmm. really trust and then my wife is one of those as well and so um having that team made this thing uh the way it was before i even presented it um so yeah being an la based comic what are some of the venues that you use to workshop your material? And if you'd rather not say, so that way people can be surprised, go ahead. UCB uh, and also, you know, the uh, Comedy Store, Laughter Factory. Oh. Places like that. Um, but really, for me, uh, the big one was uh, I used to do a show uh, at the Largo. I used to do a monthly oh, yeah. Uh, show there called saying funny things society and we kind of finished doing that just before the pandemic struck and i haven't been back since the world's gone crazy but yeah yeah that was a a, a a place for me to really showcase all my new ideas and i had other comics on and i would host the night and as well as doing sketches and stuff like that because i like all facets of comedy not just stand up i don't know if this is too inside baseball to, to kind of ask per se, but Largo, I, I hear it's not the easiest to get 
uh, Mr. Flanagan on board to go, yes, yes, you should perform here per se. How did that work? Did you have a friend that went, uh, race is good? Or did he know who you were first? Going back quite a bit now, I think, yeah, Flanny definitely knew who I was. Uh, and so I think I, I, we approached, I don't, can't remember who approached who. Oh, I think, you know, going right back, uh, we did a flight of the Concords night there. So I was ah. with the Concords and, um, I, I, I think I sang Leggy Blonde and maybe did some stand up before their show. And uh, so that's when I would have met Flanny. That's probably going back um, 10 years now. Uh, and so then we, we spoke about me having my own night after that. As somebody who reads a lot of books about comedy, sees every documentary you can, you learn that the comedians who kind of made it out of the comedy store, you know, if they didn't get passed by Mitzi, they just held that ax the rest of their life. Like, she didn't think I was funny. It was one of those kinds of things. So it's good to hear that you're able to work with UCB and Largo and Comedy Store. I don't think there's a lot of comics who can cross lines like you, apparently. Well, maybe it's the international thing. You know, yeah. I started my career in New Zealand and then went to the UK and I was uh, there in, in London and all through the uh, United Kingdom for like eight years doing all the clubs. Um, and so I did the comedy store and stuff over there as well as all the, the jonglers chain. And I even went over to Europe and did stuff. And then so when I eventually came to America and that was mainly through acting, uh, I had I had I had an in, you know, and so I guess having that sort of international uh, thought process in my head, how, how things are slightly different. I, I'm not too Americanized. I don't have that like channel. I've got to do that club and then I've got to reach that level. And then I'm finally, I'm going to get paid there. And then I'm going to host that. I don't, I don't play by any of those rules. I just turn up with this weird voice and go, Hey, can I have a go? And you know, part of it, I guess is charm and innocence. I, I think also a little bit of talent and a little bit of work. Oh yeah. Maybe. Just, just a tiny bit right there. <laughs> but but uh, to your credit, your career is very interesting to me. And in that not only, you know, you're doing great work for decades now per se, but you have all the success as a standup, your acting credits are great. And then your voiceover work and the work that you do for animated shows, you're even in the video game Fortnite per se, which I may or may not be the oldest person who plays. But uh, <laughs> but my point is you have these disconnected kind of careers that you're one of the first comics I became aware of who is able to do all the voiceover stuff. Do you like being able to juggle all those things or did that come out of necessity for, hey, I got to work? Uh -huh. Good question. Uh, if I was much younger, yes, it would have been necessity. But I think they just, they fit it into place. They, one came after the other. I never chased any of them. The one thing I did want to do from an early age was uh, voice work through animation. I thought with my voice and the fact that I can also do a lot of different silly voices mm -hmm. um, meant that I would be perfect for, for kids' cartoons and things. Now that eventually caught up with me, um, but... And when it did, then the floodgates opened. And, you know, if you have a look on IMDb, I do a lot of uh, yes. kids animation. And I love it. I really love it because um, one of my favorite things is just mic work, being in a little studio, uh, mm -hmm. having a script, being able to use the script, also go off the script, do sound effects, do funny things with my voice, with my vocal uh, dexterity. So that was cool. Anything else is really just... Um, fitted into place because of the zeitgeist, because of comedy, which I think in general in the world is a uh, sort of big living organism. The mm -hmm. bubbles goes up and down and things are hot right now. Things are not hot right now. Things are too controversial. Things that, you know, it's, it's right. like, you know, and everyone who's into comedy follows it. And so I just sort of ride that wave and ended up in America and, and with the Concords and stuff. And then the stand up, you know, which I'd already done then mm -hmm. could be transferred over. And I, I just, I guess I had uh, a lot of strings to my bow. Um, yeah. But when it comes to acting, that's, that's also one thing that I really wanted to achieve as a, as a teenager was, was get into TV and film. I just had no idea how to get there. And turns out that stand up, you know, and, and through comedy was, was going to be the, the method. Yeah. And what you mentioned before about liking to do voices and sound effects and so forth, your Westworld routine is great. <laughs> we see uh, great vocal dexterity there, great physical comedy as well, per se. So luckily, you're able to merge that with your stand up, per se. But 
is the next stand-up hour in progress yet, or is it just too soon to even think about that? Uh, good question. It's, I'm never not thinking about funny ideas, and I'm always writing things down, uh, but I've definitely slowed down uh, in the idea of putting together a, an hour show and touring it, probably because the world's so screwed. Mm. But, um, you know, never say never. Uh, I think if, if this one really succeeds and does well and people want more, then it'll, it'll happen. But, um, you know, right now my acting career is going really well. And so I'm enjoying mm -hmm. that. It gives me more family time. And, you know, being a solo stand up touring, you ask any of them that have been in the game for a long time, you know, it's, it's torturous and uh, it's, it's a young person's game. And if you can get away with moving on from it, um, you know, that's fun. But one thing we'll always miss as comics is that live audience and that can often draw you back after a few years. So uh, let's see. I'm not in any hurry right now, but, <laughs> but maybe in a year's time. What are some of those hobbies, if you're allowed to say, when you're on the road? Because let's face it, being a comic is very different than a band where the band has to do sound check. Um, oh, yeah. There's usually a lot more press that you have to do in the band. Whereas if you're a comic, you can more easily go, yeah, I'm not doing press. I, that's yeah. not me. I, I, so you can kind of hide and really just show up an hour before the show, get on, do your set, go out the back door. So comics, unfortunately, have a lot more idle time on the road than musicians mm -hmm. do. There's, uh, not every comic sells merch, per se. So there's not that. There's not a loadout, et cetera. When you're on the road, how do you like to occupy yourself besides, you know, calling home and checking in and making sure you're not in trouble in that sense? Yeah, well, one of the great things about being a comic is that you do get to see the world. And so you want to take that in, especially when you're in different towns, because when you go on stage at night, you want to address the crowd uh, in a way that shows that you're interested in where they're from and that you've had a look around and that you've mm. got some local colloquialisms that you can talk about uh so there's that i definitely uh take an interest in the place i'm in and to that end with having a lot of time off i will really sort of get to know the place anything weird particularly about it because i'm into the weird and paranormal as you might know yeah. so if there's any freaky creatures or or things like that i might talk to people about it my podcast i do uh may uh may my benefit from me being in a in a very weird place in the world um and other than that it's it's really sort of eating it's like finding the coolest place to eat and the local craft beers and then usually with my team we'll we'll uh we'll find the best restaurants and then just enjoy them and you know share each other's company cool well two quick questions and then you're a free man and the first question is What's a TV show or a movie or something like that we should start if we need a new show to dig into? Because I'm still, you know, going through the whole Hulu queue and the whole Netflix queue and all that. And we always need more things to watch. And per se, why not ask a, a comedian who's funny? You know, what OK. Well, I, I'd recommend uh, Reservation Dogs, which is which is I think that's on Hulu. Um, that's really, really funny. Uh, it's got a style that um, reminds me of the New Zealand comedy style. And now Taika Waititi, my friend, is obviously involved in that. Um, but yeah, it's just really refreshing, good comedy. Um, and other than that, I also like, uh, depends whether you're into animation. I'm a big fan of uh, Castlevania. That's on Netflix. I uh, recommend that. It's really, really cool anime style uh, vampire uh and it's got good um good voice actors in that one as well um and when it comes to drama well you can't go past something like invasion i just started watching that it's got sam neil in it he's a friend of mine and uh yeah it's about aliens attacking the world which you know fingers crossed it happens soon yeah. this place needs fixing <laughs> and then uh making reference to your friend that you just mentioned right there. I wanted to know in closing, how much research was needed to be done into the werewolf spectrum about their ongoing fight with, you know, the people who do things in the shadows? 
Uh, I didn't do too much research uh, other than the fact that I knew, you know, that werewolves uh, turn uh, when there's a full moon. Um, and so one of the funniest things about this, uh, the werewolf facet of, of what we do in the shadows is that they're just nerdy guys. You know, they're not in any way kind of uh, jock sports people who you might think would rip their muscles and, and get aggressive. These right. are guys who uh, work in IT or, you know, uh, and so I think that was a really funny aspect to it that, that Tyker and Jermaine put in there. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes too much uh, thought can, to, can send you astray and get you on a level of um, complexity that you don't want to be at because you want to be free and realistic. So to be real, real people tend to not overthink anything. They just, they just live their time. So as an actor, you don't want to sort of overlearn uh, things. And, 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 you know, this is, a, this, is a, this is a big debate that's gone on since the beginning of time, but people that spend you know, years at drama schools, they might know so many levels of how you are supposed to act and with all these different techniques right. um, that, you know, it, 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 it could be too complex for their, for their performance to come out as fresh as you want it to. So in a nutshell, yeah, I mean, do a bit of research so you know you're not going to do the wrong thing. Like, there's more rules, by the way, with vampires, like with mirrors and being, you know, let into houses. Far and like that. Yeah. Oh, there's my dog barking. <laughs> uh, so yeah, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Well, I'm looking forward to that next special, the next role, etc. Just keep up all the greatness, Darren. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Darren. Outro cast. <laughs>